Welcome to the Ricky Matthews Show from the Citizens Bank Studio. Hope you're having a great day as we continue on this show to celebrate all the amazing people working across the state of Mississippi to make this a better place to live, work, and play. Hey, listen, I hope you uh, watched the show or listened to the show last Thursday. I had Wesley Smith on. He's the executive director of the Washington County Convention and Visitors Bureau and uh, he's deeply involved in that region, especially in Greenville. We talked about the amazing show that they're doing, telling the Mississippi story uh, with both uh, storytelling and music with Steve Azar uh, for Viking Cruise Lines there in, in Greenville. But we had a great conversation. But during the conversation, we got into a discussion about the Mississippi Delta. And, you know, what what do we need to do to help the Mississippi Delta um, get out of its depression. I mean, a friend, Lee Abraham, said that the, the Delta went into a depression and never really got out. And the Mississippi Delta is part of the overall scheme of numbers for Mississippi. And until we can lift the tide of the Mississippi Delta, the reality is that the numbers for Mississippi, and I don't care what number you're looking at, will never really compare uh, favorably. And so that's something we need to talk about. I thought to myself, I need to invite my friend Joe Max Higgins from the uh, Golden Triangle Development Link to rejoin me. I had recently, in fact, posted uh, a conversation that he and I had had a couple years ago where he said that coastal Mississippi was an 800-pound gorilla if they could ever get their six counties together from an economic development point of view. And I've had that conversation with a number of people. But there were a lot of emerging reasons why I needed to get Joe Max on, uh, not, the, not the least of which we just needed to catch up because he's such a – a, a gifted economic development guy, and he's also just fun to visit with. And without any further ado, let me welcome my friend, Joe Max Higgins, back to the Ricky Matthews Show. Joe Max, how you doing, buddy? I'm fine, Ricky. Thank you for having me. Hey, listen, we're going to tell people about what you do for people who have not heard us talk before. Uh, and you're, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're recognized nationally. You've been involved in doing case studies at Harvard. You know, the list goes on and on. But I have to, I have to immediately notice you look like you have lost weight and you look healthy, buddy. What's going on? Well, I, I went to the doctor uh, a few months ago and. And I gained weight, and uh, blood sugar wasn't where it needed to be. And I just said, "Hey, I got to, you know, I got to get with the program." So um, I've been uh, trying to eat very, very well. Uh, uh, I've told some folks I I haven't had a drink of scotch in twelve weeks. Uh, hadn't had a beer in twelve weeks, and I've averaged less than a glass of wine a week. Uh, and I've been eating tons and tons of fish. We went to the uh, we went to our conference on the coast not too long ago, and we went by one of the seafood places and and loaded up and. Uh, I'm having tuna tonight, and I had triple tail last night, and uh, and I've got a uh, grouper uh, 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 the next night, and and eating salads and, and trying to trying to exercise and just you know have an overall program. Well, I'm I'm proud to hear that, man. I mean, you know, look look as a former CEO, I understand the stress you can be under, especially when you're rallying around an economic development project, sometimes that can take years to do. And you've got multiple of those things happening simultaneously. It can really drain you mentally and physically. And stress is a killer. As Again, as a former CEO, I know well. And I think about when I was publisher of the Sun-Herald in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, if I hadn't had such a commitment to taking care of myself, you know, exercising, trying to eat right, et cetera, I probably would be dead today, Joe Max. I, I'm confident in that. And you work around a lot of people who are under stress, and some of them handle it really well, and some don't. And if you don't, if you don't wrangle it down to, to the mat when you know you've got an issue, it can kill you, man. And I, I congratulate you on recognizing that you had a challenge and doing something about it. And man, the results in just 12 weeks—that's awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. By the way, I asked Joe if I could mention that on the air because I would have never like said that if I didn't, if he didn't uh, sort of go along with me on that. But I think it's inspiring, and I think everyone everyone has a challenge. Everyone's going through something. You may not always see it, but uh, and we talk about that on this show as a way to inspire people to uh, to you know get hold of themselves mentally and physically so they can enjoy life and find happiness and. That's that's really important. Hey, Joe, Max, while we're while, before we really get into any lengthy discussions about things that might be on our minds, why don't you give people a sense of the Golden Triangle Development Link and what you guys are up to? Well, we 
we <clears throat> I've been here 21 years uh, in June. Um, uh, we we started out as the Columbus Lowndes Development League, just Columbus and Lowndes County, uh, and we did that for about half the time. We were just one county doing development. Uh, then we added West Point and Starkville uh, about 11 years ago, plus or minus. We added uh, those two counties and became the Golden Triangle. You know, I, I'll argue that we're probably Mississippi's only true regional economic development group. Uh, you know, Pool Alliance put together a deal for. Toyota, it was three counties. Uh, Lamar and uh, 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 Forest County, since Hattiesburg in both towns, you can argue, you know, that, that they're multi-county because they're, they're cities in both counties. But, but I don't think there's anything that has an operational budget staffing that does regional like we do. Um, you know, since we've been born, we've done about ten billion dollars worth of projects, over ten billion, uh, over ten thousand jobs and have developed four mega sites and we are in the final stages of developing the fifth mega site. Um, those mega sites total uh, over 7,000 acres just by themselves and they're home to a steel mill and an aluminum mill and an engine plant and a tire plant and, and who knows what comes on the, on the next one. Uh, but a lot of infrastructure has been installed, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, just a lot of, lot of development, and, uh, and we keep looking to do more and more and more. So uh, hopefully uh, we're changing our place. Uh, we got a new study from Bill Fruth that, that we've got, we haven't released yet, but the reduction in welfare has been phenomenal. He did this 10 years ago, has been phenomenal the last 10 years. Um, the uh, West Point, which was at 22% unemployment, you know, is around three. Uh, uh, and they are one of the top uh, micropolitans in the state for new manufacturing jobs and outright new jobs, in, in, uh, not in the state, in the country. And so uh, putting up some pretty good numbers, changing some lives for some people. Uh, and... Uh, um, you know, I think that well, those reductions in the welfare rolls is indicative of these people are getting jobs that pay enough that they want to go to work. And, you know, they're working at Packard Engine Plant making sixty-five or $75,000 instead of being at home on, on, on assistance. And uh, it's changing our place. And with the aluminum mill coming on board, I mean, it, it won't be finished until next year. Uh, another thousand jobs paying well over six figures. Uh, I think that'll just continue to change our region. Hey, I shared this quote that I came across. I don't know who said it, but if someone posted it. It made me think about a lot of things. Um, it made me think a lot about after Hurricane Katrina down here, what we had to experience and rebuild from. To some extent, maybe it applies to the Mississippi Delta in a conversation we'll have here shortly. It certainly applies to you guys when, when you think about challenges you faced uh, at one point in your ju juncture when the Sara Lee Hog processing plant closed and you had 2,000 jobs that were lost in your area. But the quote said, don't be afraid to start over. It is a chance to build something better this time. You learn to think big, but the Sara Lee closing, though, was a defining moment in changing the trajectory of how y'all approach economic development, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, it, and, and with West Point, it wasn't just Sara Lee. It was Blazon Tube. It was Flexible Flyer. It was Artex. It was, I mean, they lost five or six companies just bam, 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 bam. And, you know, everybody talks about the Delta, but when we started working over there, Clay County, Mississippi was the highest unemployment county in the state of Mississippi at, I think, a high of 22%. <clears throat> You know, more than is Aquina, more than Sunflower, they were the highest in the state. And I haven't looked in 60 days or so, but last time I looked, they were three something percent, uh, uh, which is a significant change. But we've created um, probably about 2,500 jobs over there in the last 10 years. That's incredible, in, Jay. In a, in a town of 10,000 people, in a county of 20,000 people. So don't tell us it can't be done because it can't. Listen, Joe, you think about the approach you took with the, with the mega sites. Th that, that took a big leap of faith, didn't it? Sure. Sure. So, look, I got here, I got here in the summer of 2003. The first two projects I worked was a, sweet, a fancy sweet potato plant. 
to make frozen microwavable sweet potatoes. Uh, uh, the people that invented the Cajun injector and make Louisiana hot sauce, the Brown family, uh, were looking at building a facility up here to do fancy sweet potatoes. And Kingsford was looking at put, building a charcoal plant. Those were the first two projects I worked that I would tell you would be singles at best if we were playing baseball. And then TVA, Bill Adams, John Bradley, and his team came out with the Megasite program. And I went up to Nashville with 500 other people and uh, from all around the valley. And, and my light went off and said, this can, be the, this can be the inciting incident. This can be the change for us. And we came back. We did the work, which was hard and took a long time, six weeks to, to replicate a, a car company looking. It was a competition, and only two sites were certified in 80,000 square miles of TVA, us in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Weeks later, months later, just a few months later, the steel mill came in. Uh, the day we broke ground on the steel mill, 30 days, we signed our options on our second mega site, and Pat Car came in. And then we did, we picked up West Point and we did the uh, Prairie Belt Power Site. And while it was still under option, Yokohama took the lion's share of it. And then we did the, in, the uh, Infinity Mega Site that we had for 10 years. Uh, put the water in, put the sewer in, but that's now home to the $2.5 billion aluminum mill. And uh, now we're developing Cinco, which is a 1,500-acre mega site. Probably, to be honest with you, probably the best one we put together so far. Uh, and it will undoubtedly be the Gulf states and the South's preeminent mega site, in my opinion, uh, uh, when we get everything finished and done. So let's okay again. Think of the think of the uh, this way, people who are listening. Uh, it just could be anybody who really doesn't understand economic development, but has an appreciation for what you're saying. Um, when we get back on the other side, we'll talk a little bit more about what a mega site is, and we'll um, and we'll you know go from there with with our friend Joe Max Higgins from the Golden Triangle Development Link. We'll see you after this. Welcome back to the Ricky Matthews Show from the Citizens Bank Studio. I have my friend. Joe Max Higgins, who's a world renowned as an economic developer, someone I really enjoy visiting with. I've learned a lot about what it takes to take a leap of faith in, in, um, in economic development and hit home runs, which he has done over and over and over again. But as I mentioned, a lot of people who listen to the show, they don't have an economic development background, but they're interested in the conversation that Joe Max and I are having. And we'll talk in a few minutes about how it might apply to some other areas, the Mississippi Gulf Coast, the Mississippi Delta, and so on. But we're talking about the development of these mega sites. And you've heard him say it many times, and he, the most recent one that they're developing, he says it may be the best one they've done yet. And why don't we do that? Because you've actually, what you've done is you've built knowledge from each one you've done. You've improved upon it and done better. And, you know, that's the way it works. The more you learn the more you learn how much you don't know, and it keeps you thirsty to learn more, and you get better, and that's the way this works. It keeps you humble also. But um, what talk about what a mega site is and what makes this one so special. Well, you know, in TVA's program, uh, you know, it, it's a site of about 1,500 acres with 1,000 developable. They want you to have a railroad. They prefer for you to have two. They prefer both of them to be class one if you can you got to be in an attainment area. you got to be 50 miles from a commercial airport. you got to have four-lane access to roads, water, sewer uh, at a certain capacity, electricity at a certain capacity, all to support that. And, uh, and, and, and then you've got to have all your due diligence done, your cultural resources, your wetlands, uh, all of that, that work has to be done. Soil borings, uh, not just surveys, but alpha surveys. In other words, when this thing is done, it is literally a absolutely plug-and-play ready to go site and uh, we've been lucky enough to do four of them and we're doing the fifth one right now and uh, it's 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 not for the faint of heart uh, uh, total cost of the developing this mega site will be about 53 million dollars uh, that we will end up spending on it um, it said another way to tell you how kind of gutsy we are we're, we're looking at spending 53 million dollars on spec uh, on the come and uh, uh, to get this one developed. But we've, we've done four of them, and we've landed Yokohama, Steel Mill, Aluminum Mill, and Pack Car on them. Uh, all of those, probably, well, the, lumen, the Steel Mills are over $3.5 billion. Aluminum Mill is $2.5 billion. Pack Car is over a $1 billion. Yokohama right now is probably $400 million and probably doubling that in the next probably 18 months. 
so these are great big projects. And what we do is we take the proceeds that we make from these. Uh, we spend some of the money on the deal, but we take the proceeds on the deal and we plow it into the next project. So with the Cinco Mega site, we're going, to, we're going to spend money buying that site, and we're going to be able to purchase that site less, about $200,000 a year. We are buying that site with profits and proceeds that we made on the aluminum mill deal. So the Board of Supervisors, that's since day one, and there's some of them have changed. Some of them are the same, but some of them have changed. They have always been very, very helpful and, and very pro-business, and rather than spend it on asphalt and 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 and, and give away things and, and and just just government spending, they see that if they spend this on deals, that it will increase their tax base again and again and again. So they get it. They've been very supportive. It's been real fun to do. Yeah, well, look, success success uh, breeds understanding. Uh, I, in preparing for the for the conversation today, I actually saw a story from back in June where Lyons, Lyons County upped their contribution. They re renewed their relationship but upped their contribution from, I think, 350, 350000 to five hundred a year. But for them, that's an investment, man. That's a small investment in terms of what they're getting in return. But you've, you know, it took years to align these people. And when you get new supervisors, you got to bring them up to speed. But you, you've got a lot of stakeholders that are engaged in this over multiple counties, and you got to work hard to keep them aligned too, don't you, uh, Joe Max? Yeah, that you know, uh, this, this this go this last cycle. We ended up with, six, we got 15 supervisors or three counties. We ended up with six new supervisors. We've never had that happen. And if you don't take the time to invest in those guys and girls and bring them up to speed and help them see what's going on and get their buy-in, you know, all the work you've done up to this point is no good. OK, uh, and normally it's been one or two that we had to bring up to speed, but six out of 15, that's a, that's a big number. Well, it's good to see your success. I just, when I ran across that particular story, I just thought an example of, <clears throat> you know, you, you have to, re, you have to always remember that in a lot of ways, this is sort of the ultimate private public partnership. You know, you've got a board that's full of uh, successful business people, and you've got to have government uh, uh, you know, f with you because it requires changes and adapting and whatever. And the thing that hit, hits me, some people may say, man, we can't do another mega site. There's a, there's a workforce problem in Mississippi. We can't find the people to work there. But, I mean, you believe that if you build it, they will come. And that has happened, hasn't it? Yeah. And, and I was talking to somebody last week about this. You know, I cannot remember the last time that I had somebody talking about a drug problem and getting people to work, okay? Now, if you go to other places, other states, other places in this state, you may hear that. We just don't hear that. But here's what I will tell you. When you've got a $120,000 job and you get 45% of your salary and profit sharing, that's a significant number. And, and people are just not willing to take the risk over smoking a joint on the weekend. You know what I mean? Uh, the other thing as far as getting the workforce, now we are getting strained in some ways because we are the jobs we're bringing in are so much better pay-wise than the jobs that were here. Okay, so some of the little guys are getting squeezed. They are. Uh, but the big guys, we never had a meaningful conversation on available labor for the aluminum mill. They're going to hire a thousand people, and we never had a meaningful conversation about where the labor force was coming from. We talked about the community university. We talked about the state programs that they have to help recruit and train and do all that, but not any big time meaningful conversations. Now, the smaller manufacturers, as the bigger ones come in, they're getting squeezed. And so we are having to spend some time with them. But last night, we went and got a tax exemption from the city of Columbus on an expansion on a company. It's a third generation family company. Uh, they rebuild electric motors, huge electric motors. Uh, uh, their two biggest clients are the steel mill and Southern Corporation, for example. And uh, uh, I said, well, what are y'all paying? They said, our average pay is $78,000. Mom and pop, 58 employees, hiring 15 new ones, they're paying $78,000. Those folks don't generally have trouble finding people. <laughs> 
I can understand why. I can understand yeah. why. You know, the the other the other thing, there's so many angles to this. There's no way that we would ever be able to cover all of the angles that what and and this is not intended to be sort of a comprehensive discussion about how you find success, but but to just to cover some interesting angles of what you're up to so that people who are listening can appreciate what it all is about. But you know, when you have that kind of success with your mega sites and these big companies, these higher paying jobs, what it does to the community to improve the quality of life, on, on just about every dimension you see changes, you know, housing opportunities, uh, cultural opportunities, more restaurants, more shopping, downtowns get revitalized. I mean, the, the residual impact in the towns that are part of this is pretty significant, isn't it? Yeah, and 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 on a very small, you, you take West Point again. Uh, you know, since Yokohama announced and Pico and the other guys. Now, this may not be a big deal to some of the listeners, but they've got a new Burger King. They've got two or three more burger joints. They got a Jacks. Uh, they got a. a couple of chicken places they probably on from from south side of town up to highway 50 uh, captain d's they probably gotten 12 or 13 new restaurants in west point as just a result of this growth and so and somebody said well the burger king's not a big deal i said well it's not unless you don't have one <laughs> you know, yeah, right. and uh, it's but but it's uh, uh, and, and you're seeing it all over. And I mean, you know, uh, probably Starkville is the one uh, that you see really. Uh, 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 they're probably getting some of the advantage of the newcomers coming in and the growth. Uh, never before uh, have we seen man. Usually, the management that came in in the early days lived in Columbus or Lowndes County. Uh, the last three general managers of the last three plants we've got have chosen to live in Starkville or County. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, everybody's getting a slice of the pie. And remember now, our workforce is not just our Golden Triangle communities. Our workforce comes from 37 counties and two states on a regular basis. Uh, for instance, at the steel mill, the steel mill works, gets a check from the steel mill. 950 people. There's probably close to 2,000 out there, but 950 get a check from the steel mill. 111 of those live in Monroe County, the county north of us. Okay, uh, 111 out of 950. That's a significant number. Okay? Yes. So it's not just benefit to the Golden Triangle, but Lamar and Pickens County, Alabama, Monroe, Chickasaw, those counties, Knoxville, Lamar down south of us. We are sucking from a big region, and when you're paying. 75, 85, 95, 100 and up, uh, you know, it's just not uncommon for people to drive an hour, hour and a half to go to work. Well, listen, I had uh, I had Sid Salter on recently from Mississippi State, and we talked about what's happening at Mississippi State. But Mississippi State benefits from the, the these conversations in more ways than we can even cover on this on this conversation. But one of the ways they benefit is by listening to the industries. And having a better understanding of how programs ought to be adjusted. When we get back on the other side, we'll just continue this part of the conversation with Joe Max Higgins. We'll see you after this. Welcome back to the Ricky Matthews Show from the Citizen Bank Studio. I have uh, Joe Max Higgins, someone I really enjoy touching base with. He's head of economic development in the Golden Triangle area. He's the executive director of the Golden Triangle Development Link. When we went to break, though, we we're talking about again. We're not trying to cover all the all the pieces of this. We're just trying to trying to have an interesting conversation about how the tentacles of economic development, when you're hitting on a lot of cylinders and you're making a lot of home runs, how those tentacles touch in so many different ways in a region. I mentioned Mississippi State uh, when we went to break. I, mean, I am curious though, Joe, uh, what are what are some of the things that you're doing with Mississippi State now that might be innovative and cutting edge? Well, you, you, you got to understand, you know, 15 minutes from my office, I got a major research in, in institution. And one of the things that we have been in discussion with them for a couple of years now is uh, with the steel mill, with the aluminum mill, there's some opportunities. And uh, my organization, The Link, endowed a scholarship uh, for a metallurgical student. They've started a new metallurgical engineering degree. You can get a degree in metallurgy. That's still all your metals and, and how, they're, how they're formed. And I think the next step that we need to do with, and I think it's going to take some help from our U.S. senators and Congress people and, and others, is we would like to see Mississippi State be a center of excellence for metallurgical 
uh, in particular aluminum and steel. And the thinking on that is, at least in our part and dealing with the university some, is our, our airplanes and our aircraft and our ships are, are dealing with, you know, Vietnam era steel and aluminum. And some of our competition worldwide are dealing with next-gen materials. And I just think it's a perfect marriage to sit down with somebody with SDI's capability making steel and aluminum to build the next-gen aluminum and steel for our shipyards in South Mississippi and our aircraft manufacturers and give our men and women uh, the best materials they can to fly. And I think Mississippi's brains and SDI's ability to make it, uh, that's a marriage that we ought to make happen and we ought to get a few dollars to make that happen and we're already a center of excellence for uav some people call them drones unmanned aircraft in mississippi state i'd like to see mississippi state be a center of excellence for metallurgical in particular defense industry and metals good stuff man again we could go for a show after show after show talking about all this but listen i want to go back to how i started the show this this really terrific conversation I had with Wes, Wesley Smith and one of the one of this he's again t- head of tourism in and uh, the Greenville area of, of the Mississippi Delta. One of the things that I mentioned to him was uh, I, I have a place in Mississippi Delta. So I spent a lot of time there and I see the challenges there. I see the opportunities too. But but one one of the things I said is that it's almost like a hurricane has hit the the, the Delta and we need an all hands hit the deck. You know, multiple county, multiple effort led by probably the governor to to really go in and say, okay, where are we going from here? How how do we how do we take that quote I shared a few minutes ago about, you know, let's let's try something different. And one of the points that Wesley made is, Ricky, I can't tell you how many plans have been drawn up over the years about the Mississippi Delta. Um, I'm not one who, you know, my, my my history has not been one who embraces plans that go on a bookshelf. I've, I've been, my whole career has been based on implementing plans. You know, I, I, I can't stand sitting still. We're going to do something and we're going to make change happen. But I, I got to see it after Hurricane Katrina. I had the, the, the opportunity to write the forward to Haley's book on the, on the storm. And amazing things happen when you can come together and look at things like that. So if I were to, to open an office in Greenville and pay you a million dollars to come work for, on behalf of economic development in, in the Mississippi Delta, what is the first thing you do when you hit the office? Well, I, I, you know, I'm, I, I've got a young, I got a young friend that is buying for an economic development job right now, and and they ask him to sit down and do a hundred day plan what he would do, and I helped him work that plan. And the 100-day plan includes sitting down with all the stakeholders. I mean, you got to sit down with your city leaders, your county leaders. Uh, my guess is one county probably can't do it. Uh, this, co- this business just costs too much. Uh, you know, I have access and touch about $7 million in annual operating on water systems and sewer systems and in my leak budget as well, about, about $7 million. So one county that small probably can't afford it. So I would be saying, you know, what counties can we put together that makes sense? Uh, you're going to have to sit down with the elected officials and and, and look. God love them, okay? Uh, but but they're all looking out for the next election, the something, the something, the something. And you're going to, somebody's going to have to come in and do, it, do a little bit of tough love and say, hey, this is how it's got to work. Here's how it's going to work. But get their buy-in, show them the picture, figure out what products you have. If you don't have products, you're going to have to add them. Uh, you're going to, you are going to have to work on the workforce in the Delta, okay? You're going to have to sell that because most consultants coming in, and that's that's a red flag. There's going to say not anybody there, and the people that are there may not have the skill level that you need. So you got to work on that. But now I will tell you this. you got to be careful that the educational bureaucracy doesn't say, you know, it, it, it tickles me that everybody wants to be on the economic development train. Oh, this is economic development. You know, former Representative Jeff Smith said keeping your cemetery mode is economic development in some people's minds, okay? But what 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 happens if you're not careful is the bureaucracy start taking over and putting their putting their fangs in the in the in the in the neck and start sucking resources. Uh, workforce is important, education is important, but it's gotta be measured enough that they, that they're not just taking all the resources. You gotta have Sites, water, sewer, electricity is the long pole in the tent right now. Uh, there's not enough electricity nationwide. Uh, 
Uh, the, the, the power companies have got into a woke deal where uh, coal is bad and solar and wind is good. And all of them, all of them are facing shortages in electrical power. And as, as data centers and AI come on more and more and more, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. We're going to have to start moving faster as a country. Um, you know, it, but you got to have electricity, you got to have water, you got to have sewer, you got to have sites, you got to have the workforce, and then you got to have one voice that if some if a consultant's coming in, and you got to build a relationship with them. Because when I got here, one third of our deals came from consultants, one third came from the state, and, 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 and one third came from TVA. Uh, you got to work though. Now it's uh, now it's about sixty percent come to us directly, about forty percent MDA. Uh, but you got to build a relationship with those consultants and sell them on what you have. And then when companies come in, you got to present. You got to show them. Uh, Zig Ziglar will tell you you got to see yourself being there. You know that, Ricky. I mean, you, you got to see yourself being there. You got to paint a, a picture to these companies coming in that they see themselves there, that they can succeed. Uh, some of this is emotional. It's it's facts and figures and and blocking and tackling. Some of it is emotional. Um, but you know, and and then then the community has just got to believe in itself and that, that they can do it. Uh, but it can't be done short term. And 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 the biggest challenge anybody has is dealing with the with the political personalities and what's expedient today that might not be the right choice tomorrow. Uh, and and it's hard. I mean, you know, uh, Mississippi Business did a story on me last week or so. Uh, the first year I was here. The president of the biggest bank, the mayor, and the general manager at the uh, uh, airport went around to get me fired because I didn't fit in and I was rocking the boat. Uh, thank God that uh, my boss has said, hey, we're going to let him stay a little bit longer and see. But, but sometimes you got to break some eggs to make some omelets. And here's what we know. Uh, it's not working there. It's not working. So you got to try something different. And you talk about, about plans and reports. We don't put plans on the on the shelf either. This is one of my plans uh, that I just touched. And I think you can see it is pretty dog-eared uh, because it gets, it gets taken off the shelf and used almost every day. Uh, but, but here's what we know. What's happening is not working. And can you do a sea change? And is it more than just lip service? It costs money. Uh, everybody's got to get working on the same page, the same way. And and for those that are not on the team, uh, you know, throw them in a ditch and get somebody else uh, because life's too short uh, not to. Um, that's the challenge that everybody has, uh, in my opinion. And that's not just in the Delta. That's everywhere. Yeah. So, but, but Joe Max, okay, so let's go back to the real world. As an economic develop, developer in the Golden Triangle area, when you look toward the Mississippi Delta, do you see a future that could be different than what you know than just agriculture? Yeah, it, 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 yes, it can be. But again, somebody has to has to look and realize. You know, we we track Bill Fruits doing our doing those studies for us. He does the polycoms every year. It's a measurement of micros and metros in the state of Mississippi. Twenty six things he looks at, and and you can be a tourist town, you can be a manufacturing town. Uh, you know, places in like the Carolinas are always at the top. Uh, and, and he, he evaluates those. If you look at, at, at the metropolitans and micropolitans in the state of Mississippi, none of the metros uh, west of I-55, all of them are in the bottom third in the country. Let's do this. Well, that's, a great way to, that's a great place to stop. We'll pick up right there with Joe Max Higgins. When we come back on the other side, we'll see you after this break. Welcome back to the Ricky Matthews Show from the Citizens Bank Studio. Uh, we were uh, Joe Max and I were chatting during the break. Um, rising tides came up. I remember my time as publisher of the Times Picayune, where we talked about that book a bunch, and I had the pleasure of getting to know Hotting Carter. And Hotting Carter and I used to talk about this on a pretty regular basis. Our affiliation together was through the Knight Foundation. But um, but the point that you were making is that when you look at, you take I-59 and you look at the, the, the important economic development data points to the west and to the east, we've got big challenges in this state that have to be addressed if we're ever going to improve the overall ranking of Mississippi, don't we, Joe, Joe Max? 
That's right. And what I was telling you is that a lot of the micropolitans in the state are in the bottom third of the country, okay? Uh, uh, there's 550 micropolitans, and Mississippi is going to have two or three that are in the 540s and 550s. Now, what I will tell you is I score them each and every year, and, and we look at who the governor is, we look at the big projects that came in, and we model all the metro micropolitans, because that's what we are, and how they move. And, and I will tell you this, uh, when Haley Barber came in, we, didn't have, we weren't very positive for performance. And in a short period of time, uh, we, we color the boxes red, green, and yellow. Green is better, yellow is the same, red is worse. And, and what we saw with Haley Barber, mostly in his second term, is he made a, a big improvement. Even though they might still be low, he improved most of the micropolitans in the state. And then when Phil Bryant came in, his first term, I think it was Haley Fumes, but he improved it as well. Haley, and Phil's second term it didn't okay but what i will tell you is in tay reeves his first term uh he has already exceeded in the way we calculate these haley's numbers in his second term yeah and Tate's doing his second term now i think while while they still may be low nationwide most of the micropolitans in the state are improving the indianolas the places like that are improving and uh, uh, I, I think some of this is just incremental. You got to do it a step at a time, step at a time. But when you look at that, and I'll send it to you, Ricky, when you look at it, uh, it's pretty damn neat. Yeah, I, I, I want to see it. You know, I've said many times that Tate Reeves has <clears throat> staked his legacy on being an economic development governor. And you can tell, man, look, when you're a governor and you're focused in the way that he is, and <clears throat> Bill Cork and that team focused the way they are, you focused the way you are. <clears throat> We can be successful. Well, look, look. It wasn't. It wasn't just a, a, a governor go that 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 they were touting a billion dollars in the state as being a big deal. Okay. Well, we've done a billion dollars four or five times just by ourselves. A billion dollars is not an aspirational goal for the state of Mississippi. Uh, I've been saying over the years, somewhere in the five or six billion dollars ought to be, if we ain't doing that, we're getting behind. Now we're, now we're throwing up 19 billion, it's nutsy numbers, okay? But, but, but when we were doing a billion dollars and everybody was calling it a big deal, it wasn't. And yeah. I will tell you, Bill and Governor, you know, they are ambitious. Uh, 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 I told somebody the other day, I said, they got that shot up that arm and they like it. And uh, <laughs> I don't see them stopping uh, uh, for a while, for, well, for three more years. But 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 it's, you got to make it a priority. You got to do it and you got to have expectations. And I think that's been lacking uh, in, in, in the state, in some parts of the state for a while. And I'm glad to see it's being a priority now. Now, you look at the data center in, in uh, Madison and what it took to get that. And, you know, really, you know, you're talking about what it takes to make economic development work, electricity being a big part of it. Um, that data center is a really good case study on what's going to be necessary for the future. It's, uh, there's, there's a lot to learn from that, isn't there? Well, Ricky, we're working two right now. We worked that project. Well, that project was a five-year project. We worked that project in the early deals that, that Joey got. But but we're working two right now, and one of the guys was in here the other day, and he said, you don't understand. we got to solve this electricity, and data is going to be a big part of it, and AI is going to be a big part of it. And he, and he looked at me in the eyes. He said, if we don't figure this out, it's a national security issue. You do not want – well, think about it. Think about it. You know, you don't want this crap done in a foreign country somewhere else. You would like for it to be done here. It has to be done here. It has to be. You know, there's a lot to learn. And listen, every time you and I are together, it just opens up more focus. But the thing that, that I'm always reminded of is that what makes a good leader is someone who has a vision and can communicate that vision and someone who is doggedly determined. Listen, I can remember when I was communicating a future that most people didn't agree with, most people didn't like, and then slowly but surely they understood that they better get on board because this is kind of the reality of where we are. At the time, I was talking about newspapers and the digital tsunami and all of that. Um, but I, I was surrounded, Joe Max, in my career by some phenomenal, visionary, innovative leaders. And I've seen them have to row against the tide and find success. 
And economic development is the same way, man, because there's always going to be changes. There's always going to be new approaches. There's always going to be new industries, AI being a big one of those. And you kind of uh, fit the bill for the kind of leader we want to see in that. I appreciate you spending time with me. Well, thank you. And look, you need you need to get girls to invite us to the island uh, this season so we can just sit around the table and uh, and talk. And solve the world's problems. I will solve make that happen problem. for sure. It has been a pleasure to spend time with you, my friend. Thank you, brother. You bet. This has been Joe Max Higgins from the Golden Triangle Development Link. Listen, have a great day, and we'll see you tomorrow. All right. Y'all take care. <laughs>